All yours. It's all yours, Rick. Okay. Welcome to Cedar Lane United Methodist Church. The international Sunday school lesson for today comes from Acts chapter three. It tells of the healing of a lame beggar as Peter and John went to the temple to pray about three o'clock in the afternoon. It's the first recorded miracle by the apostles after the birth of the church in Acts chapter two. You know, we're going to celebrate the day of Pentecost in a couple of weeks. And this is the first miracle after that. And it tells a story of this healing, which continues through Acts chapter five, four. As we learned last week, the church age began, began on the day of Pentecost following Christ's resurrection. Jesus had been taken up into heaven at the beginning of the book of Acts on the Mount of Olives near Jerusalem. But before, his, but before he left his disciples, he told them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. At the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus said to his disciples, when they were in Galilee, he said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. These two statements summarize the mission of the church. At the beginning of Acts, and as Christ's disciples for this current generation, we have the same calling and purpose today. We are to be empowered by God's Holy Spirit and Christ's presence. And we are to serve as witnesses of everything we experience from God. And through our testimony, people will be baptized into the church in the, name, in the names of the persons of the Holy Trinity. These new converts will be tur turned into disciples like us. And we are to teach them everything we have learned about what God wants us to do. The church has now been pursuing this mission for almost 2,000 years. And today there are about 2.3 billion Christians alive on earth. And throughout all time, who knows, billions. On Pentecost, the church received the power that Jesus promised. The Holy Spirit descended on a group of about 120 believers. The number is given to us in Acts chapter 1, verse 15. And they began to speak in languages from all over the world. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 2 that God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven had gathered in Jerusalem that day. And each of them heard the good news in their own language. This supernatural communication reversed the confusion of languages that occurred in the Tower of Babel story in Genesis chapter 11. Immediately after the Tower of Babel story, beginning in Genesis chapter 12, God promises that all the peoples of the earth would be blessed through Abraham. And the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 was part of the fulfillment of that promise made possible by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah. At the end of, chap at the end of Acts chapter 2, after Peter preaches a powerful sermon and about 3,000 new believers were added to the church, the Bible tells us that the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. 
Everyone was filled in awe with the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47. That brings us to today's lesson at the beginning of Acts chapter 3. The Bible just told us that the new church focused on what John Wesley called the various means of grace. As a matter of fact, he defined those means out of that passage that I just read, and he said they were things like teaching and fellowship breaking bread together, prayer, and helping to meet each other's needs. In Acts chapter 5, verse 42, the Bible also says day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming, proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. In Acts chapter 3, the chapter opens up with Peter and John going about their daily routine, headed to the temple courts during the afternoon hour of prayer. As I understood it, looking at a temple diagram, they, they entered through a meeting area called Solomon's Colonnade. It was a big outdoor hallway with columns. And they came to a gate inside of that called the Beautiful Gate. As they came to that gate, they encountered a man who had been lame since birth. In chapter, chapter 4 of Acts, we learned that the man was about 40 years old. And that was a fairly old age in those days when life expectancy was much shorter than it is now. The Bible says the man was put in that location every day near the beautiful gate. Presumably, presumably by family and friends, so they could beg for assistance, so that he could beg for assistance from the worshipers headed into the temple courts. Since the man had been put there every day, and since Jesus and his disciples had gone into the temple several times during the Lord's public ministry, including the last week of Jesus' earthly life, there's a good chance that Jesus and his disciples had encountered this man before. If they had, the time of the man's healing had been reserved until Peter and John's encounter with him in Acts chapter 3. As Peter and John entered the temple area, the man asked them for money. Peter looked straight at the man and said, look at us. Then Peter goes on to say, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. Acts chapter 3, verse 6. After that, the Bible says, taking him by the right hand, Peter helped man up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Acts chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. As I'll say several times, this is the first recorded miracle after the birth of the church at Pentecost. And it was designed to further the growth of the church in addition to providing the man with the help he needed. This healing caused a crowd to quickly gather within Solomon's colonnade around Peter and John and the man who had been healed. And Peter used the opportunity 
to deliver another major sermon to the people who had gathered around them. Peter tells the crowd that God raised Jesus from the dead and that he and John were witnesses to Christ's resurrection. He goes on to say that all the prophets had foretold the Messiah would suffer and that they had predicted what was happening in those days with the birth of the church. As I mentioned in another les lesson, Jesus had basically said that all the scriptures point to him. And this is another evidence of that point. After Peter delivered this sermon, the Bible says in Acts chapter 4, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in, in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John. And because it was evening, they put him in jail to the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Acts chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Luke devotes almost two full chapters of Acts to the lame man's healing. The first detailed description of the apostles' activities after Pentecost and it shows the church growing rapidly. At one point, Peter speaks to the elders and the teachers of the law in Jerusalem and says, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how the, he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Acts chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Healing the lame man was an act of simple love and kindness, but it was also an important event in the growth of the church. This man was not healed of a physical infirmity for his own sake alone. He was healed for the sake of everyone living in Jerusalem back then. And he was healed for the sake of everyone living today, particularly the 2.3 billion Christians living around the globe. Truth is, everybody doesn't get physical healing. And even this man, went 40 years before he experienced healing at a relatively old age for those days. There was something far more important at stake for both the man and for everyone else. What matters most is spiritual healing and oneness with God. I mean, the lame man eventually died and even Lazarus who was raised from the dead, eventually died again. The lame man first wanted money from Peter and Paul, but he got something even better when he was healed physically. After his healing, the Bible says the man held on to Peter and John, Acts chapter 3, verse 11. I believe that this man became a Christian and eventually received something much better than physical healing. He received one with, with God and eternal life. All the physical things the man received were temporary, but eternal life lasts forever. Jesus and the apostles did many acts of kindness to show that God loves us and is concerned with all the details of our lives, even the smallest details. But the goal of discipleship is oneness with God for all eternity. We are remade in the loving image of our creator so that we can spend all eternity in his glorious presence. And beyond that, we work as God's servants 
and as a royal priesthood to bring God's loving and eternal kingdom to earth. Like we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I believe spiritual healing and growth of the church were the main reasons for this miracle. Luke collected eyewitness testimony and provide us, provided us with a powerful example of what God's people can do under God's leadership. Peter says that he personally witnessed Christ's resurrection. He said that in his sermon in Acts chapter 4, I believe it is, um, or 3. Anyway, Jesus calls us to be witnesses. And witnesses are supposed to testify from personal experience. Hearsay evidence is generally not admissible, either in a courtroom or in our work as Christ's disciples. We talk about what we've experienced ourselves. Consequently, at this point in the lesson, I want to tell you about some of my own personal miracle. Today's lesson spoke to me about God's focus on spiritual healing. I believe the spiritual benefits of the miracle I received from God are far more important than the physical benefits, and there were a lot of physical benefits. I want to take you back about 10 years to 2013. I was spending most of my time in Texas but I was in Knoxville a couple of months a year, and I was still a member of Inskip United Methodist Church, one of the predecessor congregations that became, became what is now Cedar Lane UMC. At that time in 2013, I weighed over 300 pounds. And, all, and, and I was only 5.5 feet, eight inches tall. I developed type 2 diabetes, high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. Uh, my mama made me go to the doctor, said she was going to fire me and disown me if I didn't go to the doctor. And I did. I also developed psoriasis over most of my body. And that led to problems regulating my body temperature. I remember sitting outside in the sport coat in 90 degree temperature in during a hot Texas summer. And even though I was dressed warmly and sitting in the sunshine in the heat, I was freezing cold. When I turned to a dermatologist for help, the first thing he said to me is, you're a mess. And I was. You all prayed for me. I was put on a prayer list in the bulletin and I got the bulletin through the mail. Back then, everything didn't come over the internet. And uh, it was a real comfort to me to know that people were praying for me every week. Well, slowly I lost a little weight and got treatment for my psoriasis. And then when my mother got sick in February of 2020, I began praying and meditating on the Lord's Prayer every day. God began to tra gradually transform me spiritually, and I needed it. But then, in December 2021, Pastor Rich Richard preached a sermon that changed my life. There's been several important sermons by preachers throughout my life, and this was one of them. The sermon was about changing our lives by changing our attitudes and habits. He had read a book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And it described the practical steps for changing our thinking and behaviors through the transformation of our habitual thoughts and actions. James Clear was a secular writer. It was a secular book. It was a good book. I read it too after Richard recommended it. But, I, but for me, and I believe for Pastor Richard, 
His book suggested the possibility of a far more important process of renewal that was made possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I believe this spiritual process of renewal is a modern expression of the method that is at the heart of Methodism. John and Charles Wesley were practical men. They lived during the Industrial Revolution where everybody's lives were torn up. There was all kinds of addiction and poverty and suffering. And they spent a lot of time teaching people how to let God change their habitual behaviors in order to become more holy and loving people. Some say that's why they didn't have a revolution in England because the method of Methodism allowed people to adapt to all the changes taking place. For me, focusing on the spiritual transformation of our habits through the power of the Holy Spirit is the method that defines Methodism. Changing my habits has begun to change my life. Today, I weigh 155 pounds. I think it was 154.6 this morning, just to be precise. <laughs> Roughly 146 pounds less than I weighed at my heaviest. So I've lost about 48% of my maximum weight. Since I started the program recommended by Pastor Richard, I've logged about I've logged the calories for over 3,000 meals and walked more than 5 million steps. I'm approaching the point where the focus on my eating and exercise program will shift to maintaining my current weight while continuing to build mass, muscle mass and reduce fat. It's something I'll have to continue the rest of my life. I'll have to work like I'm working now just to stay where I am. So it's a so the whole process is about permanent changes in your life, not temporary changes. Now, I believe that these changes that I have had are a physical miracle that I received from God. The miracle took place over 17 months rather than instantaneously, but it was a physical miracle nevertheless. Like the the man in today's lesson who had been lame for about 40 years. I've had a weight problem since I was about eight years old or about 49, 59 years now. In a way, I'll be dealing with this issue the rest of my life, but I'm experiencing many tangible benefits from the healing I have received. My blood sugar, blood pressure, and cholesterol have all returned to normal. And my psoriasis has disappeared. That's an answer to prayer that many of you prayed. And I'm healthier now than I've been in decades. Still, physical health is always temporary. It's a temporary thing in the scheme of eternity. As the popular saying goes, no one is going to get out of this world alive at least not physically. When you think of things that way, you soon realize that the Apostle Paul was right when he said that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. Galatians 5, verse 6. It's the spiritual healing that really matters. It's becoming more loving, becoming more Christ-like, being remade in the image of our Creator. Shortly after I reached my current weight target, the Holy Spirit led me to a scripture in Matthew where Jesus said, what goes into someone's mouth does not defile them, but what comes out of their mouth, that's what defiles them. That verse hit home. I've had a problem with overeating most of my life. And I will continue de dealing with my 
eating problem the rest of my days. But overeating, and I have been an overeater, that's never been the main issue. It's not what goes into my mouth that defiles me. It's what comes out of my mouth. I have an attitude problem, a trust problem, and a compassion problem. My growing relationship with God has been hindered far more by what I've said and done in relation to others than it has been hindered by what I've eaten. As the Lord said to prophet, the prophet Samuel, the Lord does not look on things that people look at. People look at the outward appearance. But the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7. And as Jesus said in Luke, in Luke, a good man brings good things out of the good stored in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Luke 6, verse 45. Over mo most of my life, my spiritual problems have been most clearly evidenced by the things I say, not the things I eat. The external things we do and say point to more basic spiritual truths. Over the last three and a half years since my mother got sick in February 2020, I've begun to see that most of life is a sacrament. The word sacrament has traditionally been defined as an outward and visible sign of an inward and spiritual grace. The physical things we experience in life are signs of more basic and, and a more important spiritual reality. My physical healing has been a sign of a far more important spiritual transformation taking place in my heart. And although I'm nearing my weight target, I'm still very far from the person God wants me to be spiritually. I'm reminded of the words of John Newton that I've read before when Newton said, I'm not what I ought to be. Oh, how imperfect and deficient. I'm not what I wish to be. I abhor what is evil and I would cleave to what, cleave to what is good. I'm not what I hope to be. Soon, soon shall I put off mortality and with mortality all sin and imperfection. Yet, though I am not what I ought to be, nor what I wish to be, nor what I hope to be, I can truly say I'm not what I once was, a slave to sin and Satan. And I can hardly join with the apostle and acknowledge by the grace of God, I am what I am. God healed me physically over a period of several months to demonstrate to myself and to others that he cares for us and has the power to transform us from the inside out. He's also made it very clear to me that he transforms us over time through a discipleship process. And this process of transformation is a wonderful gift made possible by the power of the Holy Spirit and Christ's sacrifice on the cross. This inward transformation is far more important than any physical changes I've experienced. Although the healing of the lame man was instantaneous over time, it was still an outward sign of an inward and ongoing transformation made possible by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was the first major miracle after the birth of the church at Pentecost. And that miracle got people's attention and Peter's subsequent sermon in the temple courts caused the body of believers to grow to 5,000 men. The acts of kindness that God does through the church today have the same ultimate purpose that the healing of the lame man did. They tell us that God cares about the, our daily lives and wants to give us good things. 
but more importantly, they're outward signs of an inward transformation made possible by the grace of God. It is the spiritual transformation that really counts. Material benefits are temporary, but the love of God lasts forever. The possibility of inward spiritual transformation is the real point of the lame man's healing. And it is the main point of this lesson. I'm here to tell you that spiritual transformation is possible. We can become new and better people through the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes time. It's step by step. But it can happen. We can offer the possibility of that transformation to other people. People who are suffering, hopeless, and looking for something better. When we do that, we're following, in the, in not only in the footsteps of Christ and the apostles, but also in the footsteps of John and Charles Wesley. And we are practicing the real method that is behind the Methodist movement. That's it.